Hello and welcome to Six Figure Authors, the show that helps you take your writing career to the next level. I'm Lindsay Baroker and I'm here with my two co-hosts. I'm Andrea Pearson. And I'm Joe Lalo. And our guest this week is fantasy and nonfiction author Brian Cohen from the Selmore Book Show, which I bet lots of you guys already listen to, and also from the Best Page Forward Book Description Service. And Brian's also been doing the five-day Amazon Ad Profit Challenge, uh, facilitated by a Facebook group, but not just a Facebook group, he assures me. <laughs> and uh, he's going to be starting up a new one here in April. So uh, once we suck all the information out of him, we'll uh, mm. give, you, give you the links and <laughs> make sure you can find that if you're interested. Brian, will be a husk at the end of this podcast. <laughs> well, welcome to the show. For those two or three people out there who don't already know you, why don't you tell us how you got started with writing and publishing? Sure, and thank you guys for having me in the midst of the the virus extraordinaire. So I first got started with blogging back in the day, and and I kind of transitioned after not making much money in blogging into writing, and I pulled a bunch of my blog posts together and learned about publishing that way, and. I enjoyed putting out the books. I've I've enjoyed writing fiction as well. I have eight novels now, but man, I I put together these uh these multi-author Facebook events back in like 2013, 2014, and I just loved authors. It was like we I would get together all these people that like half of which won't even talk to me now cuz they're so cool but like all these author teachers back in 2013, I won't name the ones who don't talk to me anymore. Don't worry. But um, all of us kind of discounting our books to 99 cents and, and I would get all the authors into the room and say, all right, you're on the, it was like a carnival shift, like a kid having to like uh, their parents having to watch a particular carnival booth during like a two hour period it was these authors about these authors who write for authors having to answer questions in this group for two hours. And like, I had them overlap and it was like crazy, just like dozens and dozens of questions an hour. And I was like, this feels good. I really like this. I like, I like how social it is. And so I really, I think I've been kind of thinking about, how people learn a lot. And I have my nonfiction books for, for authors and for writers and for other people. But I've been thinking a lot about like, what are other ways that people learn? And I think I've just kind of like secretly back burner been obsessed with like, well, what if just like a bunch of people are crazy and ask like a thousand questions all at once? And so that was kind of like, that's kind of where my head's been for the last six months or so. It's a funny place, my head. Well, you're kind of leading me into my next question because I yeah. was going to ask, I know you've written fantasy and um, the portal. I think you're renaming them. It's no longer like portal combat. It's no longer <laughs> as punny as it was yeah. with portal combat. And uh, yeah, there, there were a bunch of veil to the chief. Um, there were some good puns in there. <laughs> So now it sounds like you're kind of getting more into the coaching. What would you say your focus is now in 2020? And like, is the coronavirus stuff changing? Are you pivoting at all to address it's that? Coronavirus to market is, is my new <laughs> is focus. Is that the new thing? <laughs> yeah. Um, I actually was talking to a client today and they were like, I want to write this book about uh, the 1918 pandemic. I'm like, I don't know. Amazon's kind of cracking down on stuff. I'd be careful. But um I would say my focus here in 2020 is Amazon advertising. Like for several years, just running best page forward book description business, seeing the people who succeeded with the new descriptions and the people who didn't. And the people who didn't, I always ask the question, well, did you send any traffic to it? Like, did you promote the new description? Did you promote the, the book? And pretty much everyone who did not said they didn't know how. And I think that right now, Amazon ads are the most affordable 
uh, sort of like, I mean, we're, we're, we're picking between a motley crew here of, of difficulty because Amazon ads, Facebook ads, and BookBub ads. I've heard mathematicians talk to me and say like, none of these make sense. What is going on here? And so I, I think Amazon ads are like the easiest way for someone just coming in off the self-publishing street and being able to actually figure something out. Um, okay, so my question, and I've got a whole ton of questions related to descriptions. Not going to get into that right now, though. Um, how has I'll your answer background? Everything, Andrea. Everything you want. So okay, awesome. Just going to ask all my questions right now, and there's going to be about thirty of them. And Lindsay and Joe are just going to have to hang in there. <laughs> I love it. Okay. Um, so how has your background in comedy and improv influenced your current career? Um, and then as a side question to that, what is the best way for listeners to apply what they know to what they do? Because you've kind of done that quite a bit, I've noticed. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely like, I, I, I love being able to bring my comedy in and it's interesting. You, I, I don't know if y'all do this out in the world here, but when I see like a weird Facebook ad advertising me something like a course or, or whatnot. I always just like click in like, Oh, how's this guy doing his thing? I'm kind of interested here. I, I don't always just report the ad trying to assume someday all ads will go away. Um, you, you know, the only ads I get targeted by are Brian Cohen ads. And so <laughs> what can I say? Um, but I, I found one ad that, I thought was interesting. And I was like, man, I guess I could have made some real money if I, um, <laughs> I guess I could have made some real money if I had done it first, but it was talking about how like classes and webinars and everything are um, one of the reasons they succeed is performance. And I see like, you know, I know you guys have had KM Shea on, at least I know on your old podcast, Lindsay, I don't know if on, and Joe, I don't know if on the new one, but um, she does a lot of Facebook lives to her readers. And a lot of that is performance. And so I think that a lot of my connecting with fans, definitely so much of performance and having done improv and comedy have, have come into my life. And, and, and infected my, I should do as many like uh, uh, virus puns as possible, infected my, uh, my, my marketing and my writing. But with the, with the writing, a lot of improv is just like, start your scene right away, get into it, have no clue what you're gonna be doing, which is very pantsing, which is very um, being able to get past the blinking cursor really fast. So a lot of that has come in to my writing life. But as far as what you already know, obviously, if you're a subject matter expert on like a funeral parlor or something, you could write like the funeral parlor cozy mystery. I swear it's the next big, uh, it's the next big subgenre. Um, but <laughs> If you know something, you can obviously bake it into characters and whatnot. But I, I'm, I come from the marketing side of things, and I really think that a lot of the things we need to do, especially during this time, is connect with people. So if you know how to do something from an old job, like I remember the old Jay Thorne new coding back when nobody knew how to do uh, multi book, uh, multi author box sets because it was too hard and all we had was caliber and that was really annoying and so he knew how to hand code them so he was like one of the first big in on the box sets with post apoc because he could hand code ebooks and so if you have something you can bring in on the marketing side that you can maybe help someone with maybe you can help a six figure author with something so that they can give you some of their expertise or they can help you out in some way. I think there's a lot of people that once you're actually making a living doing this, you're almost a production factory and you don't have time to like explore all these other things necessarily. So if you're the person that is like, 
ooh, Facebook events. I love this. And, you know, or whatever the thing is this year in 2020, yeah. I don't know what it'll be. Instagram, who knows, you know, if you can become the master, sometimes you can just invite some of those bigger sellers in and they'll promote it to their list. If that, especially if that's all they have to do, it's like, or show up for an hour, you know, and you're going to handle all the background stuff. Um, so we did want to ask you a little bit about book descriptions since you have a lot of experience, not just with your own books, but with how many have you done? Thousands now? Over 2,500. All right. Thousands. So we'll ask you about book descriptions for some tips and then kind of segue into Amazon ads because who doesn't love Amazon ads? <laughs> so just for starters, what are some mistakes, like just some common mistakes you see authors making with their descriptions? I think it's the, it's the rush factor. People are writing them fast and writing them, writing them chunky. Like they're putting, they think that they need to get every idea into it. So despite having a book that is totally absent of run on sentences, the blurb has more than one run on sentence. And it's because it's difficult to know what to leave out when you have written the book and you think everything is important and every character is important, especially y'all epic fantasy writers out there with your 10 protagonists. Um, and then you, you, know, you come to me and you're like, hey, each one should have a paragraph. And I say, no, blurbs don't really work like that. Um, I can't choose a protagonist. Um, I think that so much comes from just letting it breathe, letting things have their space, not feeling like you need to pack everything into a single sentence. Uh, I, in, in, in my Facebook group, Selling for Authors, and when people send blurbs to me, I almost have like a go-to, here's what I'm going to do first to any blurb that comes at me with run-ons. I'm going to say, Rewrite this blurb with no more than one comma per sentence. Go. And then, then, you can, then you can come back to me and talk more about it because usually it's those multi-break multi, uh, sentences that are the ones totally dragging down the blurb. Yeah, it's, that's what I was thinking about when I've seen ones where I'm just like, uh, we don't realize that it's actually hard for human brain to like parse it if there's so many things packed into there. And if anybody gets lost anywhere along the way, they're just going to be like, nope, there's a thousand other books in this category I can go check out. So are, are you a fan then of kind of shorter blurbs overall, just a couple paragraphs, or do you allow for a little more? We usually don't do more than two or three paragraphs. I think that it's a matter of each, each genre is going to be different. Romance, usually we give each protagonist uh, a paragraph to shine. So romance ones are going to be a little longer than fantasy or certainly like two main POV, um, any genre really, like two different detectives or something in mystery. But we definitely still keep it short. Usually it's still under 250 words. Um, and to your point, not every sentence needs to be the same exact length or it's still going to feel choppy. It still has to have its ebbs and flows, but leaving out the giant sentences entirely is probably in the blurb's best interest. Now, descriptions are like my, one of my favorite things. I love talking about them. So most of my questions revolve around descriptions. It's fine. <laughs> So everybody's going to be like, ugh, except I'm like, this is cool stuff. So, um, so I'm going to, okay. So my first question about description is what are good examples of calls to action and how do they differ from um, genre to genre? So we keep them pretty steady on our side, but I will say that if someone is like wants to do a call to action, but doesn't want to go all in, there is an option. So I like to say, buy book title to do something today. Buy um, the six-figure author show retrospective one through 1,000 edition to uh, unlock an incredible amount of publishing information today. 
So I always say by title to get the information, get whatever entertainment, get whatever. And then I say today. I always like the urgency behind it of saying, get it now while supplies last. Um, but I think that for people who don't like saying bye, there are other verbs that can be used like explore or discover or unlock. Uh, but I'm a big fan of bye, mer, to do this today, straight across the board, every genre, every whatever. Now, the phrase I've come to love the most, I think, teaching wise over the last six months or so is your data tells a story. You certainly can try a different kind of call to action for your romance, different kind of call to action for your mystery, and then let it run for a month and see if conversions change in any way. And then you can say, oh, actually, Brian's full of crap for my genre. I'm going to do this and it's going to work better for all of my books. And that's totally fine. You're so graceful. <laughs> I do what I can. <laughs> um, do you always recommend authors use hooks in their descriptions? And I mean, and it, I think maybe we should describe what a hook is because my clients, so I'm like, you need to put a hook in your description. They're like, what's a hook? Mm -hmm. So I mean, feel free to explain what that is. And then is there ever a case when a hook wouldn't be useful? Well, I've also heard hook used two different ways. So it gets confusing. The hook that I tend to refer to is kind of the line that would go on the movie poster, the, the big one-liner that gets people excited that isn't necessarily referring to your character or even by name, but it's, it's kind of more about the, in, in our estimation, it tends to be more about the conflict and then the obstacle, really. Um, so for Harry Potter, we, we would say the conflict is... So Harry just found out that magic exists, but the most powerful wizard in the world wants him dead. So it's like, he's excited about magic, but Voldemort wants to kill him. So having, having something that's kind of, it's almost like the bird's eye view of the story, but in a way that is very high stakes, usually death or love, if it's literary fiction, maybe enlightenment, but still then death or love being kind of the main hit that that hook needs to be. I think almost every book description needs a hook because I think that there's the old copywriting maxim, which is 80% of people stop reading something after the first line. So if your first line is, Billy was tired with life. It's like, okay, well, we're establishing Billy, but I don't care, I'm leaving. But if it was like, um, the world has just exploded, one young boy is its only chance of survival. Like, oh, and then it's like, Billy's tired of life. Okay, interesting. It, like, it's different depending on the order that you present things in. And so presenting that high stakes hook first is always what I would recommend. That makes a lot of sense. And again, like when we're talking about how they advertise things like movies that cost millions of dollars to produce and absolutely have to succeed and they always put a tagline on there, mm -hmm. it makes sense that they must know something about what works. Um, so you one know. of the things, <laughs> you know, one, one would hope. Uh, one of the things that we've learned from guests in the past is, uh, particularly with things like covers, it often pays to pick something that matches reader expectation for the genre. Like you want mm -hmm. to s it become immediately obvious of what genre you're in uh, to draw readers in. Does that go for blurbs too? Should blurbs be emphasizing the genre tropes, or is this an area where you can start to show distinctiveness? Well, it's really interesting. I recently did a little workshop that was kind of like a bonus for, for some students that was called the Blurb to Market Workshop, which is essentially uh, me stealing exercises from Chris Fox. I, gave, uh, he, I asked him permission first. Um, but basically stealing the ideas from Chris of getting tropes together um, 
and making sure you know your genre inside and out, and then putting them in a particular order in, in the blurb using essentially the, like the, the format we tend to use. And so we don't always change the format, which is often hook, establish a character, leading up to an inciting incident, how the character's dealing with that inciting incident and eventually leading into a cliffhanger. We don't necessarily change that from genre to genre because a lot of stories are the same, but the tropes that are expressed within that, within that framework, obviously in cozy mystery, you're probably going to have some 30 something, 40 something whose aunt just died and she inherited a shop somewhere. Like if you don't have that in your cozy mystery blurb, certainly people are going to think this is a little weird. And so you want kind of those tropes to flow in naturally. Uh, But to your point, there are some genres that have decidedly different blurbs. Uh, Some uh, more active romance types tend to have a first person blurb. And so if every best-selling blurb in that genre is in a different point of view. Yes, probably you should make the effort to have it in that point of view as well. Yeah, and we were actually talking about how in urban fantasy, a lot of them are in first person, Mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, very foreign to me, but (laughs) I don't like them personally because I think difficulty wise a first person blurb is like a level 10 yeah whereas like a third person blurb is like level seven or so and so you just have to nail that voice so incredibly well while establishing high stakes it's tough well we're all 10 star authors i mean level 10 whatever (laughs) oh yeah oh yeah (laughs) Okay. Um, do you see, do you foresee the current styles for descriptions changing in the near future? You know, like, you know, that hook, that paragraph, that close, to, that call to action. And if so, I mean, would that, I mean, cause things evolve all the time and you look at traditional mm-hmm. publishing, they haven't always, most of them still don't follow that, that same format, you know? Yeah. I mean, if, and if they do, if you do foresee that changing, I mean, what would, what would you, what would you say, Brian, it would change too? <laughs> Well, um, if you want to look at where publishing was five years ago, you can always look at a traditionally published blurb now. Um, but I think that, because that's how long the production schedule is, right? Um, I think that if they're going to evolve, it will probably be to focus more on character. I think people will realize that, yes, you can throw in a very kind of generic, this is a fantasy world. Like I was going back and reading the eye of the world description for Robert Jordan. And it's just like the wheel of time turns and ages come and go. And it's like, sure, fine. All right. Are there dragons? Like is someone riding them? They explode. What's happening here? And I think that going more in the direction of, wait, why should I care about this book? Especially in like the right to market climate where you get a couple of successful books in like prison paranormal or something. And then you have like 60 of them come out and it's like, well, how is yours different than others? Especially if they're hitting the same tropes and the way they're different is the characters making an impact and being relatable because those are the ones that are going to rise to the top. So and that's a good point. Uh, I love the comment of the five years ago thing. <laughs> I kid, they, they of course. Fast. I kid. Yeah, <laughs> they can if they want to. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so I don't know if you've noticed, but there's a, a competing person who teaches descriptions too, and I'm not going to name names, <laughs> but but uh, his advice and in his group was to put a lot of white space in descriptions. So you'd have one sentence, a full paragraph break, then another sentence. And I'm wondering how you feel about that. Uh, Have you noticed if that works? Do you recommend it? Is there a specific genre that that would work best for or genres that wouldn't help, et cetera? 
Look, I love Meeksy. So, um, <laughs> hey, no names. <laughs> I'm just saying, no. And it's it's really funny because I remember at 20 Books Vegas where, where I got to hang out with him. Like, I really wanted to troll people like with some of the selfies we put out there because Brian and I are friends. But um, I think that there is probably a peanut butter chocolate Reese's Pieces version of our two description types. And I think that um, what that probably is, is some combination of best page forward descriptions with a little more white space and Meeksy descriptions with like a little more character. And so I think there's probably a middle ground in there somewhere, but I go back to my earlier assertion, which is let the data tell a story. Look, I feel like I, I recently was chatting with uh, an author and I basically had to figuratively grab her legs and stop her from wanting to stop her conversion rate test after like 10 clicks. Cause I was like, no, 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 you need more clicks. You need more time. Wait, because you absolutely need to let the data show you something. And if you, I have people say, hey, this blurb it seems to be working or this blurb seems to not be working after these 48 hours. And I'm like, like, I don't even know if Amazon's adjusted its metadata yet. It's like, give it some time, let it breathe. And so I think that, you should look at a particular description and run a test on it. And if you get a test where you're able to get like profit through the roof, then don't change anything because I see too many authors changing things for the sake of changing things when they really should just be like creating more Amazon ads or something. If nothing else, when you're kind of thinking, I need more white space and less dense, you know, I think you're going to get away from that long sentences, long paragraphs. This and, is true. You know, this it's sort of, because I start, especially after a couple sentences, I'm like, well, maybe, maybe that's enough about that and I can get mm -hmm. into the next thing. Yeah. I, I, I was kind of laughing when you were talking about the Wheel of Time because I actually did that kind of style blurb for a box set where the character, it was different characters in book one and book two. So I was like, how am I going to do this? You know, so I made it more about the world and things going on. And, and that sucker sold like hotcakes, That's awesome. <laughs> like my, my best series. So um, not to say that everybody should go do that. I still, as a reader, I'm drawn to the character stuff, but you know, and maybe in fantasy, we are trained a little bit if we grew up in the 80s, you know, reading in the eighties and nineties to uh, want that epic world. Mm -hmm. But um and I don't know how many of your clients do the box sets, but I love that that's kind of a chance to split test and just do a whole different yes. blurb, even though essentially you're still selling the f same thing, the first book. So I, I don't know. I always encourage people, don't just say like, these are my three books that I have, you know, in this box set and like copy the blurbs from the, <laughs> you know, the individual and then books. And it's like the longest thing ever. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen that. All right. Well, let's uh, move into Amazon ads a little bit. Sure. You mentioned that um, you still, you feel like they're kind of the best bang for your buck. Have you tried, I assume you've tried everything. I tried my first Instagram ad lately. I don't know. Oh, it was cool. cheap. I don't know if it sold a lot of books, but there was that. It got me a lot of likes on Instagram. I get a lot of weird likes on my Instagram ads. Yeah. Like dogs weird with names are following me now, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But um, I was wondering if you could explain a little bit why, why do you feel Amazon is is it just because people are there to buy books versus the other social media sites or why do you like it most? I think that's a big part of it. I think that really is a big part of it because people are generally lazy. And that isn't to say like people are bad or that laziness is bad. People would rather take less action. So like think of someone seeing an ad on Facebook and having to get to Amazon as it's as if it's some person on the couch having to get up and go to the fridge it's like oh man the couch is so comfy i don't really want to go all the way over there and then you know sometimes they'll get up and go to the fridge some percentage of the time and sometimes they'll be like ah it doesn't seem worth it 
and they'll click the X button on going to the fridge. So it's like, oh, good. I found this tub of cheese balls beside the couch. So I'm good for like at least an hour. But if you're already on Amazon, it's like your couch is right next to your fridge and you can just open it up and grab the stuff out of there. And I think that I have noticed, and I've had Facebook ads that are very successful too, but uh, I've noticed that Amazon ads tend to be a little bit more valuable, those clicks. And because people are just going from one page on Amazon to another. So I think that's part of the reason, but on Facebook, you can target like whatever groups Facebook decided in 2014 were okay for you to target. I don't know why they never seem to update those lists, but that's what it seems like 2014 or so. Uh, and obviously you can do lookalike audiences and all of those, and those tend to be a lot better. But uh, if you're just starting out, you don't have a list of a thousand people to create some custom lookalike audience of. You're just starting out. Amazon ads are easier because you can target any book title, any author name, any search term people are looking for. You can target an entire subgenre that your book is in. You can even target, just let Amazon take the targeting based on your existing keywords and categories. So there's a lot of positive to just starting with the Amazon ads. I've uh, done more and more with Amazon ads. So I'm, I'm certainly, they're a big part of my arsenal now. I've recently kind of come back to Facebook ads a little bit, you know, uh, part of it is, well, we were just talking about this. Um, Ricardo Fayette, who was on our show a few weeks ago, sent out a newsletter saying that um, from where he's advertising, he's seeing as a result of all the uncertainties in the market with the coronavirus stuff that a lot of people pulled out of Facebook ads, a lot of businesses. So currently, as we record this, March 30th, you know, ads are pretty cheap right now on Facebook. And I've got some converting great at like 12 cents or 16 cents, which typically has not been mm -hmm. <laughs> true for me in the past. Um, so happy to take advantage of opportunities if it's possible. And I would say also, if you're kind of a bigger seller in your genre, you may be getting targeted on Amazon by other authors, just hopefully not being malicious, but I'm sure there's some of that too, but people are like checking you out. You know, I've heard that so often from people like, oh, I clicked on this ads because I was curious what this author's doing. I'm like, yeah, that was my dollar 50 that I was just uh. bidding on my urban fantasy, you know? So on Facebook, unless they actually are fans of like David Eddings, you know, and Raymond Feist, he's a 90s fantasy authors that I was targeting for my epic fantasy box set, they're never gonna see the ads. So you're not going to get as many authors clicking on your ads to scope you out, which it's, is not a problem for most of us. probably a pretty low percentage, Lindsay, of people actually. I don't know, man. If you have a podcast, you. <laughs> if you have a podcast, I, have I a bet podcast. Mark Dawson, I bet Mark Dawson gets a lot of drive by clicks. And he can afford it. He's <laughs> I don't know. Years. What is thrillers? $3. But anyway, I've just become more of a fan of Facebook ads. I was curious if you had any thoughts on that. I've seen maybe Amazon ads come down a teeny bit on the, what the suggested ads are here in mm -hmm. March. But Facebook ads have come down a lot. Um, and it's just something to be aware of. The political and economic climate, too, can uh, be a factor. But go ahead and talk. Sorry, I'm, I'm blabbing no, all over no. here. <laughs> talk away. You're just giving me all this evidence. No, um, <laughs> as, as Andrea noted earlier, like she, she only sees Brian Cohen Facebook ads because I do run a fair bit of Facebook ads as well. I think that um, if you are actively trying to build your email list of readers and you know Facebook ads really well, yes, you should be running Facebook ads right now. If you are starting from scratch with no experience on either platform, I would do Amazon ads because they're a little more forgiving. You do not hear as many stories of, crap, I put a $10 bid and Facebook ads has now taken $1,000. Whereas on Amazon, usually you're only going to be out like 20, 30 bucks if you do something wrong. It, you can be out more, certainly. But Facebook has no problem spending your money. Amazon makes it hard to spend your money. 
And so, um, and I've definitely seen ads go crazy. I've seen different types, auto, category, keyword, all go crazy. Um, but it's very rare. And it usually only happens when you bid really high. And so I tend to suggest most people starting out bid below 40 cents because then Amazon's only going to spend a little bit of money here and there. I, I think obviously you cater to six figure authors and people who aspire to be six figure authors. And so a lot of them probably have the same complaint about Amazon ads, which is they won't scale. But I think that, and Facebook ads are easier to scale. But I think Facebook ads are easier for the targeting to totally go off the rails. And Amazon ads are a little easier to keep in the ballpark. It's not through and through, but I have definitely found that for me, uh, lead generation and selling higher price products, Facebook ads all the way. For selling books, it's definitely been for me Amazon ads far and away. So I think a lot of people have had a different experience than me, but that's been my experience to this point. Now, probably one of the bigger things that will affect how successful an Amazon ad campaign is, is whether or not the author is exclusive to Amazon or not. Uh, are Amazon ads still worthwhile for wide authors or are the page reads from KU going to make a big difference in that regard? Absolutely. And the, I actually had one of my best sales weeks in a while. Um, a lot of folks in captivity are buying the heck out of my workbooks for kids, which are not in Kindle Unlimited. Um, and those are doing exceptionally well. Uh, several of those have a conversion rate of uh, four clicks or five clicks. For every four or five clicks, I get a sale. And that is with no ebook edition, no Kindle Unlimited edition, nothing. Now, often in certain genres, having a book in Kindle Unlimited is going to be really helpful to your conversion rate and your earnings. I was just talking to someone who has all these 1,200, 1,500 page box sets. And in Kindle Unlimited, those are going to make a killing because you get uh, a good chunk of money when someone reads the entire thing. But if you are wide and you want to sell more books in Amazon, you should be running Amazon ads. But uh, there are a lot of things to consider when you're wide. There's so much to know, so much to understand, but just having your book in these other platforms isn't necessarily going to do do as much as it will advertising the heck out of your plat your book on all platforms it is actually nice because if you're not in ku you get a more accurate gauge of how the ad is doing <laughs> you know i hope someday they'll add that yes this got borrowed you know a column because right now you're just guessing you're like looking at your sales ranking you know like i think i must have got twice as many borrows as sales from that ad that's going but i'm not sure yeah, there's a lot of guesswork. There's a lot of guesswork for sure. What would you say are some best practices for Amazon ads right now? Like, I've noticed that you no longer have to write copy. <laughs> I've gotten a little lazy because I think my <laughs> conversion's worse when I actually try to write something witty. <laughs> well, anecdotally, I've found that uh, these ads without copy, which actually allow you to put more than one book into an ad, which is really nice. Um, I found that these don't always convert as well as an ad with copy. So I would still recommend using copy. Um, I would recommend going into your advertising report, your search term report. And now they make this easier because they have a tab called search terms that you can then look at. Use those search terms, use that data. When uh, my workbooks were selling extremely well the other day, I went into my advertising reports for the last, I have a lot of 
they only let you have 60 days, but I have downloaded a lot of them. So I was looking back at the last six to eight months of data, gathering all the keywords that had gotten clicks, gathering all the keywords that had gotten sales, created new ads based on those terms that had gotten clicks and had gotten sales. And those ads started performing right away, getting tracked sales. So look at your data and use it and, and have a regular system for using it. And, and that's really my, my third point. Have a habit of creating ads. I don't care what day of the week you do it. I don't care what Netflix show or Prime show you watch while you're creating them. Create ads every week. Because yes, some ads die. And some ads die quicker than others. So if you're not continually refreshing it, you could potentially be missing out. I mean, I, with this past couple of weeks of my profit going up a couple thousand dollars, essentially, it started with me saying, you know, I haven't created any ads for these books for a while. Let me get some new ones going. And those new ones kickstarted the whole shebang. So if you are frequently refreshing, it is going to be really helpful for you getting as many clicks as possible. I will say um, when I've had done new ones and then had, I've had old ones that just continue to perform and perform. Sometimes I think with the old ones that were proven performers in the past, part of it is just like the bids go up for the category. So I may find I have to go in and like adjust the bid and then it'll start performing again. Mm -hmm. But it, it does make a lot of sense to keep trying, especially if you're like me and you can't write cop copywriting, can't, <laughs> can't be clever in 180 words despite being on Twitter for 10 years. Man, um, what, all that time for nothing. You would like think that I would learn something. All that effort. <laughs> I don't have that many. I, my followers are only because uh, no, they've like disappeared from Twitter. People that <laughs> quit, you know. <laughs> you see a lot of eggs. Yeah. Um, so what are your thoughts on auto ads right now? Um, some of my most effective ads have been auto ads. So the way that auto ads work and, and some of this is anecdotal, but, uh, cause Amazon loves to share everything with us as we know, is that your books to, uh, two or more categories and seven keyword phrases and, and your title and your subtitle play into what your auto ad is targeting. So even though it seems like the ba going back to the basics, it's like, wait, this book I published in 2013, what are my seven keywords on this again? Like, is this maximized for the right categories? Have you written KDP and gotten into more appropriate categories? Um, because if you have that optimized, your auto ads can, can, do a whole heck of a lot. I have also seen some auto ads that 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 unfortunately get off track. And here's the reason. Amazon is a magical computer that when you feed it data, it says, "Ooh, I'll keep heading in that direction." So if you have an auto ad that starts getting some clicks in a certain direction, but that are actually taking your book off course from where your book should be targeted, the cost for that ad will start to go up and the relevancy of your ad will start to go down over time. I've had ads that were working for six months, auto ads that were perfect in there. And then they started to get off track. You see like, because it has the four categories of categories isn't a good isn't a good word. It has the four different segments of what it will target. Your um, your close at your close uh, targets, your loose targets, your um, substitutes, and your complements. You'll start to see like more in the loose targets because it's going to start going further and further away um, from what you actually want to be targeting. And so I definitely 
recommend as as uh, Lindsay is sneaking into the chats and stuff, using things like your negative targeting because you can actually target a negative target keywords and phrases and say, uh, like for instance, the superhero genre, which has been taken over by harem. You can say, I want a negative target harem. And then theoretically, it's not going to send those, uh, it's not going to target harem anymore. So you need to use what's at your disposal. <laughs> but we really want to keep in mind that, yes, sometimes even a unicorn of an ad that has done amazing things for you sometimes dies. And you need to, uh, you, like, there's part of me that wants to make like a factory joke about this unicorn, but I'm not going to. So um, when a unicorn does not work anymore, you may just need to recreate the auto ad from scratch. Now, I got two questions. We talk, we talk about, you know, uh, you're going to be creating new ads constantly and some ads die. Are we actually going through and when an ad is dead, not performing anymore, are we just turning it off or we just let it not perform in the background and fail to, to spend any money? Not perform, I don't care about. I think it's a waste of time to turn them off. There's people who say like, no, you're not performing ones will do bad things to your ads. Not that I've seen, not that I've heard people talk about that, that are running a lot of ads. So I don't even worry about those. I would rather you create a new ad than turn off a, like kind of an ad that's stuck. Um, but you can turn off an ad that is, uh, that is likely to be costing you money. Like the way I check if an ad is costing me money or if really more uh, accurately, if ads for a certain book are costing me money, I look to see how much I spent on ads for that book in that particular month. Then I look to see how much I've earned from that book. If I'm running at a loss, it's probable that there are at least a couple of ads in there that are not doing what they're supposed to do. They're spending too much money on bad targets or they, uh, the bid ended up accidentally being too high. Amazon really likes to make it sneaky and hard for you to change your bid. So often I'll see someone saying, I meant to set 30 cents and it set 75. And I'm like, yes, it's because you need to change your bid in a couple of places and it's not at all intuitive. But I would say, number one priority, create new ads. Number two priority, cut actively negative profit ads. And then three, if you have ads that have stopped doing anything, play around with them as opposed to shutting them off. I would rather you like up the budget or play around with the end date and see what happens there as opposed to like shutting things off and shutting them back on. Yeah, right. That makes sense. And another one, this one, you'll find I often ask questions that, that refer specifically to me. Most of my, uh, most of my series have a perma-free book one. And does yes. that complicate an, ad, an Amazon ad campaign? It does, but usually you can get away with a much lower bid. I've seen around 16, 17 cents sneak in there. Um, but then you have the, well, what does the data tell me? I, was a, I have a client I was working with who she ran the numbers. She was running at a 30 cent bid and she ran the numbers and we determined in order to guarantee you a profit, your bid should really be below 11 cents. But Amazon isn't likely to serve an ad at 11 cents. So you kind of need to make that decision. Well, am I gonna be a little riskier and bid higher than the data says I should? Or, Am I going to try to bid at 11 cents and do all sorts of other little tricks here and there to try to get it to serve? Or am I going to ditch the permafreeze and go into KU? Really, those are like the options there. And I think, I mean, I've heard of multiple authors who are just making money hand over fist, running Amazon ads to their permafree books. I think 
the toughest thing for anyone to do, not just an author, not just an advertiser, is to play chess with ads. Not think about the next move, but think about what's this move in three or four? And that is where the profit's gonna come in. It's in that read through of books two, three, four, five. If it's long enough, is there a cliffhanger at the end of book three that's killing read through that I need to change? Like, there's a lot of, a lot more forward thinking I, I believe you have to do when you are running the perma free book one and the Amazon. I yeah, hope that a, answered the question that was for everyone and not specifically just for you. Joe. Yes, only Very Joe good. has a perma-free book one. He's the only <laughs> one doing that. Yeah, I've tinkered a little bit with Amazon ads to, you know, series that aren't in KU. And I just found for me that I'd rather spend the money and get a free book see every now and then because you get so many more downloads off so much less money. But that's just me. And because I do have stuff in KU, it seems to make sense to focus on that. Because uh, I feel like KU people are like, free, big whoop, I'm in KU, these are all free, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. so it's not a huge selling point. But for those of us out there, or those who have uh, maybe just a solo book or a couple books in a series, and they feel like they're struggling to compete against people who have a 10 book series and are bidding $2 for, you know, their genre, do you have any suggestions on how to make it work with a uh, when you can't I make a, afford that. I make that. <laughs> a lot of profit off 30 cent bids. I make a okay. lot of profit off 30 to 40 cent bids. You don't always need to go with the $2 bids. I like, Lindsay, you have these wonderful long series. When you see the suggested bid, it's a no brainer. Click apply. When someone has like one or two, and they are trying to get some sales, you are going to try to need, you're gonna to need to be more clever. You're gonna to need to be more fast moving. You're gonna to need to play around with things like, well, maybe I'll target some of these upcoming book bub deals, or I'll target some of these new releases before someone has snuck onto their also bots. Like you need to kind of try a lot of different things to see what you can do. Obviously, if you've got a read through of a dollar, what some you make an extra dollar when someone buys book one based on your numbers and you've got someone who makes twenty dollars based on read through they're more likely to turn a profit off any type of ad but you have to kind of decide what your main goal is i i spoke with a, a woman today and i said what is your main goal and she said it's to have readers i don't care about the sales she was actually saying my husband makes a lot of money so i don't need the sales and it's like great it's good to know that goal if your goal is profit then maybe you need to be writing more books and creating fewer ads if your goal is something else entirely to just i want to just sell copies of this book and I don't care about the profit. That's a different goal entirely. Then you'd run ads up the wazoo for that book. Maybe you're a, a professional speaker and you just wanna sell a lot of copies of a certain book. Amazon ads are great for that. As long as you don't worry about the profit, you can do exceptionally well with that goal. So it really comes down to what you want and if you don't pick what you want then you're just kind of kind of float around and have this shadow goal that's like sort of like someone else's goal you need to focus on what you actually want and then you need to market based on what you want do you feel that for people who are maybe I mean, I know I've been complaining about urban fantasy, but I know romance is even more higher bids right now. Do you feel that with the people you work with that are trying the 30 cent bids, are they, uh, A, are they working? Like, can they actually get enough impressions and clicks on the lower bids? And B, should they be pricing their books higher so that it actually can work out and can be profitable? Like that's gonna be hard on a, even a 2.99 book, I would think. Sure. Well, I think a lot of that depends on subgenre. There's a couple of folks I've worked with 
who are in like more of a subgenre of romance that can maybe sneak in with those lower bids. And they've done exceptionally well on Amazon ads. Um, but if you are trying to get into the first page of contemporary romance or something or romantic comedy, it's going to be a struggle. I think that it's doable though with those lower bids if you're smart about it. If you gather a lot of targets, are you going to get on those top 100 new releases? No, but maybe you find a book in the top 100 most wished for. Are you going to get on uh, some really successful author's uh, latest book? No, but you could target something like deep in her backlist and see if you can sneak in there. I think that people often label marketing as not creative, when in reality, in order to be successful at marketing, you need to be super creative and you need to try a lot of different things and you need to try a lot of tar different target things. Now, I think that as far as pricing is concerned, pricing is one of those parts of your sales page that will impact your conversion rate. If you your book converts that eight clicks gets you a sale or a full KU read at $2.99, if you up it to $4.99, it's going to be higher. It's going to take more clicks. And so, I mean, I, I guess, I don't even know if they have this anymore. Do they have that like um, beta pricing tool on KDP? Is that still in there where you're like, you will make the most money at $4.99? Um, I don't think no, I've yeah, noticed that. There. <laughs> Is it still there? It's I just ignore there. it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's probably just worth ignoring, but it's interesting to consider if you run your own numbers at let's say it gets you to 14 to one when you get up to 499 you actually run the numbers you say all right well if my book earns me this much and it takes 14 clicks i have to bid this much to get a profit if and i know math is scary but um if you um if you have a 299 book and the conversion rate is a little better, run the numbers. Like, look at it. Do a little bit of division here. Do a little bit of multiplication here. Find one of those great Excel sheets that are out there. Find someone who's willing to walk you through the math. And they, they exist, um, but it's not all, like every action has a reaction, right? You change your price from $2.99 to $4.99, it doesn't automatically mean you're gonna make more money from your ads. You need to consider all the factors. Okay, so I need you to clarify something. Huh. Um, so you said if your goal is to increase profit, you should write more books and create less ads. Don't ads, I mean, just clarify that. So like for a beginning author versus an advanced author, how would that change? Well, let's take a look at kind of the, the, the time in there. Because if you have one book out and you only have 10 usable hours a week, which is, you know, maybe even generous for a lot of people, maybe you only have five usable hours per week, it takes some time to learn ads. It takes some time to create campaigns. It takes some time to research targets. If you have a, only have one book out, but you're planning on writing a series or you're planning on writing a new series to market, maybe that five or 10 hours should be spent on the book, on writing the book. Because like I said, it's gonna be easier to profit when you have more books. Now, if you have five books out, it's different. If you have five books out, maybe want, part of that is a four book series and it's good and it's well marketed and people have bought it in the past, but it's slowed down lately then you should definitely be running ads. But I think that a lot of people rush, and it's like with no qualifier, not related to Amazon ads, not related to anything. A lot of people rush, but particularly with trying to apply the latest cool marketing technique, 
when maybe they should have done it in a slightly different order. Yeah, that's a really good point. That's one of the things that I'm always telling my own clients is like, stop freaking out, just calm down, write more books. If you only have one book, you need to just, you need to be putting out more material. Yeah. Um, okay. So the ACOS, where, where does that stand right now? How much do you put? Oh, <laughs> oh you don't ever pay attention to it. I mean, how much should you mean the ACDS? Yeah. <laughs> nice. Um, so there are instances in which you'd want to pay attention to ACOS for the majority of authors that have a book in Kindle unlimited, you can go into your statistics and you can say, I want to not see certain things. I would take a ACOS out, pull it out. It's gone. So the reason ACOS, which for those of you who don't know, advertising cost of sale is that acronym. And it is how much it costs, how much Amazon says it costs to make you money. So theoretically, if you're at 100% ACOS, you have, you put out a dollar, you get a dollar back, except it's more complicated than that because it's telling you the top level sale and not how much you actually earn. So then a lot of people will say, oh, well then 70% should be what I use, but not so fast because it mashes together paperback sales and ebook sales and doesn't even include your audiobook sales. So you say, okay, then I'll kind of estimate like 30 to 50% but not so fast. Amazon misses some sales. And you're like, okay, well then what do I even estimate? And I'll say not so fast again, because it doesn't even factor in Kindle Unlimited. So take it out in most cases. If you're selling solely paperback books, solely paperback books, like I am, you can, it, with, with, I mean, I sell eBooks as well. I just mean for my workbook ads, you can pay a little more attention to it. Here's how I use ACOS. When I'm scaling up ads, I will sort by best ACOS to worst ACOS, and I will up the bidget, uh, the bidgets. That's the bids plus the budgets. I'll up the bidgets of my ads um, that have a good ACOS where the ACOS matters. I will also look at things like click-through rate. By the way, can everyone stop using the acronym CTR for conversion rate? It doesn't even make sense. It doesn't even make sense. And Amazon uses CTR for something else. It doesn't make sense. Conversion rate is different. CTR is click-through rate, is the percentage of clicks based on impressions. So I will look at my click-through rate as well. But where does ACOS stand? ACOS has killed more profitable ads than anything else in the author community. ACOS has cost self-published authors hundreds of thousands of dollars in profit, if not millions of dollars in profit. That is what ACOS has done because one of my most successful ads, I put in $7,000 and earn $21,000 in profit off the ad. According to ACOS, I spent $7,000 and got $1,000 in return. If I knew, if I, if I had assumed ACOS was right, I literally would have missed out on $14,000 in profit. Oof. F. A C O S. <laughs> and uh, again, if you're me and you're advertising a free book, A C O S means nothing because <laughs> you never earn any money on a free book. Dash. <laughs> so, uh, all right. So, I got two questions to sort of close us off. One of them is uh, a lot of people really stress over reviews, and often reviews are necessary to get advertising of different sorts. So, how important are reviews and average review score, for example, uh, for Amazon ads? 
I find number of reviews to be more important. I think it's kind of one of these sociological things of just more people have gone into something. I, I, I like, I, I think I've heard anecdotally once again, not something I can prove, but socks with 20 reviews and a 3.9 star average are going to sell more than socks with a five star average, but only five reviews because you want socks that have been popular enough to get enough sock traffic. So I would say that at reviews are extremely important. It's worth spending money to get reviews. Uh, I'm sure that folks on the show have recommended things like Booksprout and Story Origin and Hidden Gems and using book funnel group deals and all sorts of things in an effort to give out more review copies to get more reviews. Reviews are so important because they impact conversion rate. If you have more and better reviews, then you are going to potentially take that eight to one conversion rate, six to one conversion rate, and you're gonna make it a little bit uh, fewer clicks to get a sale, which you, conversion rate is kind of nebulous for some people. If you have a eight to one conversion rate, takes eight clicks to get someone to buy your book or read it through on Kindle Unlimited, and you improve that conversion rate to four to one, whether it be through getting more reviews or improving your look inside or getting a better subtitle, you make twice as much money. And so reviews are a key component to that. And I definitely recommend you don't let a book languish with fewer than 10 reviews. I really recommend even a box set. Yes, a box set too. get people to post some reviews on that thing. Okay. And uh, this last thing, again, talking about certain, sometimes reviews are necessary to get certain types of advertising. For example, BookBub, which I believe still claims they don't have a minimum number of reviews necessary to get a featured ad, but it seems like you need uh, a minimum number of views to get a BookBub ad. So uh, what I want to say is, do, do uh, featured ads like that, like BookBub or FreeBooksy, do they still have a place in the current ad ecosystem? Absolutely. They absolutely do. I recommend that if you once, let's say you're one of my favorite people because you're, you have that habit established and you're running those ads every week. So if you already have that kind of habit established, I would really recommend you run an ad of a, a mailing list type ad like a free book C every single quarter for every single series. And when you can do that regularly, I mean, Lindsay, imagine that you, in addition to running that free book seat or so every quarter to get that perma free moved, maybe you're also spending a couple hundred dollars every quarter to move an additional 5,000 copies or something like that. And so I think it kind of mashes it together and potentially increases your foothold. So I think the, the real place that those serve right now is to give an additional boost of visibility, to potentially get your book into the hands of a lot more readers. Conversion rate could be a little lower when you're using one of these services, like you move twice as many, book one permafreeze as usual, but you only, you know, you don't double the amount of book two sales. Maybe it only goes up by a little bit. So these are things to factor in, but I would use them every quarter. And if you have four different series, that means, yes, you should be running a discount every single month because you are going, or three different series, whatever, live math, if you are going to try to put that um, series out to as many readers as possible, I would do a little bit of both. 
All right. And I'll say I, as someone who's tried a lot of stuff, I've definitely found with a big backlist with a lot of series, to me, it makes sense to focus on like the two, three things that are really converting well, really selling well, and just I let the other people find the other stuff, uh, you know, and do the free books and stuff, especially when Amazon ads are quite expensive overall, if you're trying to advertise a lot of different book ones and a lot of different series. So that's just been my experience, but I know most people don't have like 12 series out there. So they're not really conflicted on what should I focus on this month? Understood. Yeah, I think it's, it's tough when you have a lot of product out. Uh, I think that always focusing on your highest return on investment, most profitable series, and really emphasizing that is, is the way to go. Too many authors go without even knowing which is their most profitable series. So don't be like that person. Make sure you know where your, where your butter is being breaded. Okay, I flipped that around. I'm, uh, I'm gluten-free and dairy-free, so I don't really I'm gluten-free about... and dairy-free right now, too. <laughs> I don't know about butter and bread. <laughs> oil and... Coconut uh, oil and... Uh, oil and gluten-free <laughs> crackers. Coconut flour crackers or something. <laughs> all right. Well, Brian, thank you so much for staying with us for over an hour and answering all of our questions. Of Can we promote something for you? You said you have a Facebook group more than a Facebook something yeah what are you working on do you actually do coaching uh like one-on-one or are you just doing the group things i i actually have taken on a few one-on-one clients folks can definitely reach out to me if that's something they're interested in i i i really try to make it the people who will get the most out of it and not something that's like go read this book take here's here's uh my bill you know like I, i i try to make it as worthwhile for people but The thing I have coming up on April 13th, Monday, April 13th, that's when it's going to start, but it runs for uh, a little while, is the five-day Amazon ad profit challenge. This is a essentially a bunch of free videos that I'm sending you and you and thousands of authors all at the same time are working on the exact same video, all of which has homework. So if you've ever felt like you're in a vacuum, if you've ever felt like isolated for some reason, um, this is a really nice uh, event to take part in because there's a lot of participation. There's a lot of kindness. Everyone is kind of encouraged to comment on everybody else's posts. So there's a lot of funny gifts. There's a lot of stickers. There's a, a lot of people who've never been able to figure this stuff out before getting really, really handhold kind of treatment through it. Like so many people who are like, I've never done an ad and I just set up 20. And it just makes me so happy because it's like, yes, I've, I've helped people make some nice cash Um, and I have really taken pride in that, but someone who just goes from no clue whatsoever, really confused, frustrated, wants to throw the laptop out the window to actually having created ads and making a small, a small profit on it. Super, super awesome. So that is at sellingforauthors.com forward slash April challenge. You can sign up for that. It starts Monday, April 13th. It is super, super free. It is super, super tiring for me and everybody I work with, but we love it. Awesome. And that group thing is super helpful, I think, for people. So definitely, if you don't want to do it alone, just through, you know, reading from a book, sounds like a great idea. And are you still doing best page forward? Still rocking the book descriptions? Still have best page forward. That's it. Bestpageforward.net forward slash blurbs. The dogs are all in. We have written some. Uh, we have written some uh, dog blurbs before. A lot of books on dogs, so they really do appreciate uh, how much we bark up their tree. The dogs are, yes, they, Lindsay's dogs, but you know, our listeners love them. They're like, can we hear more dogs? Can we hear more dogs? So we should do a dog only episode. (laughs) Good idea.
Good idea. We can have Rocket come on and mm -hmm. my, my baby, because he's kind of like a dog. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Rocket was in here, so we, we, we had that much going on. <laughs> awesome. Well, anyway, um, yeah, thanks everybody for listening. Um, and thank you to Joshua Pearson for producing the show and especially, obviously, Brian for coming on with us. And uh, you can find the show notes or leave a comment or a question at sixfigureauthors.com with the number six and come find us in our Facebook group too. We still do have that going up. And yeah, thank you, Brian, for coming and we'll talk to everyone later. Bye. Bye-bye. So long, Thanks, everybody. guys.